This is worship for Sunday, September 13th. Unfortunately, we've run into some technical difficulties and we were not able to make a live stream or even a recorded uh, worship service available online. And so uh, some folks asked if I would offer a recording of the sermon and put that online for people to see. And I thought that it would be best to also offer the prayers that went with this worship service. I'm not able to, to, um, to post the music that went with it, but, um, but I will uh, offer the rest of the service. Uh, just a quick announcement, a reminder that our church conference is scheduled for Thursday, October 8th at 7 p.m. That will be via Zoom and we will uh, publish the Zoom link for that meeting when we're a little closer to the date. So um, if you don't come across that anywhere uh, on the Facebook page or, or uh, in, a, in an email, feel free to contact George at the office. Uh, you can call him at 401-333-5203, or you can email him at office.amumc at gmail.com and he will get you the link to be able to join us on October 8th. Also a reminder that we begin a new um, adult study on Wednesday the 23rd of September. It'll be offered both at 10 o'clock in the morning and 7 o'clock in the evening, so whichever is more convenient for you. Um, it is called You Are Here, and it's designed as a first step for Christians who want to learn more about racism, about how it operates, how it affects Christian communities, and how we can resist racism. Um, it's four sessions, it's by Zoom, and you can get the Zoom link by contacting me at pastor.amumc at gmail.com. Again, that begins September 23rd at either 10 o'clock in the morning or 7 in the evening, whichever is more convenient for you. I invite you now to join me for the call to worship. And if you would like to join in the response, uh, your response is, we are more than conquerors. We are more than conquerors. In his letter to the Romans, the Apostle Paul asked, who will separate us from the love of Christ? We are more than conquerors. Will hardship or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? We are more than conquerors. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. We are more than conquerors. Let us pray. Loving and gracious God, you call us to stand firm in our faith, even in the face of powers and principalities even when confronted by forces greater than ourselves. Through our baptismal covenant, we have vowed to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves. Over the last few months, we have found ourselves at a moment of reckoning with evil, injustice, and oppression, the evil and injustice and oppression of racism. By your grace, give us the strength, the fortitude, and the will to become anti-racists. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, transform us so that we can partner with you in transforming the world. Amen. Our first scripture reading comes from Paul's letter to the Ephesians, chapter 6, beginning with verse 12. We aren't fighting against human enemies, but against rulers, authorities, forces of cosmic darkness, and spiritual forces of evil. Therefore, pick up the full armor of God so that you can stand your ground on the evil day and after you have done everything possible to still stand. So stand with the belt of truth around your waist, justice as your breastplate, and put shoes on your feet so that you're ready to spread the good news of peace. 
above all, carry the shield of faith, so that you can extinguish the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is God's word. Offer prayers and petitions in the Spirit at all times. Stay alert by hanging in there and praying for all believers. And our gospel reading comes from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 1, beginning with verse 21. Jesus and his followers went into Capernaum. Immediately on the Sabbath, Jesus entered the synagogue and started teaching. The people were amazed by his teaching, for he was teaching them with authority, not like the legal experts. Suddenly, there in the synagogue, a person with an evil spirit screamed, What have you do to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are. You are the Holy One of God. Silence, Jesus said, speaking harshly to the demon. Come out of him. The unclean spirit shook him and screamed, and then it came out. Everyone was shaken and questioned among themselves, Who is this? A new teaching with authority. He even commands unclean spirits, and they obey him. Right away, the news about him spread throughout the entire region of Galilee. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. On May 25th of this year, a 46-year-old man named George Floyd was arrested in Minneapolis after a store clerk alleged that he paid for a pack of cigarettes with a counterfeit $20 bill. Shortly after the first squad car arrived at the scene, Floyd was handcuffed and pinned to the ground beneath three police officers. In spite of Floyd's repeated pleas that he couldn't breathe, the officer kneeling on his neck didn't remove his knee even after Floyd lost consciousness and for a full minute and 20 seconds after the paramedics arrived. While not the only incident involving police brutality, the, jo- the death of George Floyd was the proverbial straw that broke the camel's back. The incident triggered widespread protests against the unjust treatment of blacks by some law enforcement officers and against racism in general. But more importantly, the incident has brought our nation to a moment of reckoning with racism. There's a rising awareness of how pervasive and tenacious racism is. Recent events have dispelled any notion that we live in a post-racial society, that we've moved beyond race, beyond racial prejudice, beyond white privilege, beyond systemic injustice. And so for the rest of this month, we're going to reflect on the Christian response to racism, both in sermons and in the the, uh, introductory study that I mentioned during the announcements. We'll talk about personal prejudices and biases, but we'll also talk about the much deeper issue of systemic racism. And when most people talk about racism, what they mean is an individual's thoughts and words and actions toward a person of a different race. But racism is more than personal. It's more virulent than the disorganized, infrequent racist acts by disconnected individuals. It exists at a systemic level which means that there's no area in American society where racial disparity isn't operating. White privilege and racial discrimination are baked into our culture, our institutions, our politics, our economy, our criminal justice system, and very often in ways that we don't recognize. Systemic racism is hard to spot except in its most egregious forms. The really insidious thing about systemic racism is that we all participate in the system, even if we aren't aware of it. Racism is bigger than our individual bigotries. It's more than the sum of its parts. It's a force of its own, a power beyond ourselves. 
We aren't fighting against human enemies, wrote Paul, but against rulers, authorities, forces of cosmic darkness, and spiritual powers of evil. The evil that Paul is referring to isn't about a devil on our shoulder trying to tempt us into doing something wrong. He's talking about powerful forces, spiritual realities in their own right. Racism is one of those powers, a demonic power. That was something that Martin Luther King Jr. and the other religious leaders of the civil rights movement understood. In 1963, a theologian named William Stringfellow spoke at the first National Conference on Religion and Race. He argued that white supremacy had to be understood as a demonic principality. He made this provocative statement. The monstrous American heresy is in thinking that the whole drama of history takes place between God and humanity. But the truth, biblically and theologically and empirically, is quite otherwise. The drama of this history takes place amongst God and humanity and the principles, principalities and powers, the great institutions and ideologies active in the world. It is the corruption and shallowness of humanism which beguiles Jew or Christian into believing that human beings are masters of institution or the ideology. Or to put it differently, racism is not an evil in human hearts and minds. Racism is a principality, a demonic power, a representative image, an embodiment of death over which human beings have little or no control, but which works an awful influence in their lives. In other words, principalities and powers, institutions and ideologies that are opposed to the will of God, racism in particular, are out of our control. Demons that need to be exercised. One of the things that I've always found odd about our gospel reading, the, that exorcism story, is where it took place. What is a demon doing in the synagogue, a place for worshiping God? You'd think that that would be the last place you'd find an evil spirit. And yet, it doesn't take much to see the evil spirit of racism in the church. Even in our own United Methodist Church that, that prides itself on commitment to social justice. You can find it written into our history, although most United Methodists are unaware of it. In his recently released book, scholar Robert Jones argues that contemporary Christians need to come to terms with the reality that all of American society, including churches of every stripe, all of American society rests upon a foundation of white privilege. He insists that Christians must confront the church's racist past if we hope to have any integrity as followers of Jesus. Well, what about our church's past? Well, as you may know, Methodism immigrated to America with colonists from John Wesley's England. And although Wesley vehemently opposed slavery, it was woven into the heart of American Methodism from the very beginning. Slavery was a profitable institution in both the North and the South, since the North trafficked in the black Africans that the South purchased. So while the Methodist Episcopal Church officially took an anti-slavery stand, that position wasn't always embraced by the folks in the pews. And it didn't mean that blacks enjoyed any sort of equality. Even in the North, segregated seating in the sanctuary was typical and blacks had to wait until all the whites were served communion before they were invited to the table. Some pastors refused to hold black infants while baptizing them and there were conflicts about access to church burial grounds. In 1794, Increasing discrimination caused Richard Allen and other African Americans to leave St. George's Church in Philadelphia, eventually for forming a new African American Methodist denomination. 
similar movements were repeated across different cities rising tensions over slavery came to a head in eight hundred forty four at the general conference when bishop james o andrew of georgia was suspended for refusing to free the slaves that he had been given as part of his wife's estate this led to the cessation of the southern churches they seceded from the methodist episcopal church to form the methodist episcopal church south that split in the church wasn't resolved until nineteen thirty nine when the northern and southern churches reunited however the southern branch insisted on the creation of a racially separated unit called the central jurisdiction to which all black members were assigned racial segregation was the price the methodist church paid for reunification in nineteen sixty eight the united methodist church was formed through the merger of the methodist church and the evangelical united brethren church the eub agreed to the merge to the merger only on the condition that the segregated central jurisdiction was finally dismantled the action was met with celebration among black methodists and with dismay and outright anger among members of the former southern denomination consequently a few dozen of congregations permanently withdrew from the united methodist church and three decades later bishop william boyd grove declared racism has lived like a malignancy in the bone marrow of this church for years maybe you had no idea about american methodism's failings when it came to racism most folks don't it's really hard to hear how racist our church has been but it's important to come to terms with our past with our history because it informs our future robert jones says that we're at a critical pivot point in the direction of christianity in the united states Recent events have pushed conversations about race to the forefront of the national consciousness. This cultural moment is forcing Christians to move beyond forgetfulness and silence and to declare their allegiance either to a religion that reinforces white supremacy or to one that actively works to dismantle it. The leadership of the United Methodist Church has made it clear that we will be among the latter, among those who will become anti-racist, among those who will actively work to exorcise the demon of racism. Let's be honest. Exercising racism from our church, from our society, from our own hearts is hard, painful work. As our gospel reading noted, the unclean spirit shook the man violently and came out of him with a scream. Driving out the unclean spirits of racism can be traumatic, overwhelming. It can shake the ground of what we believed to be true. But like the possessed man in the gospel story, it's the only thing that will heal us individually and collectively. So where do we begin casting out the demon of racism? How do we even begin to come to terms with systemic racism, much less dismantle it? Well, in a word, grace. The good news is that as we confront our history of white supremacy in our institutions, our church, in our own psyches, as we undergo the process of repentance, God is faithful to set us free from guilt and shame. The good news is that we have a relentlessly redemptive Savior who heals and transforms everyone he touches. The good news is that the power of the Holy Spirit working in us, in the words of Will Willimon, to give you a more godly life than the one you were bred by the structures of white supremacy to live.
The good news is that the grace of God enables us to live different lives than we would have lived if we had not been met by God in Christ Jesus. It's grace, not merely our own determination, our own effort, the power of our own will, but grace that enables us to become anti-racists. Will Willimon insists that moralism, calling for improved behavior without dependency upon God's grace, moralism is no match for racism. But through divine grace, we're invited to become partners with God who's already at work in the world to defeat racism, who's already busy casting out demons. We don't have to do that work alone. We can't do that work alone. But as partners with Christ, who transforms the world with and through us. William Stringfellow was right when he claimed that racism is not an evil in human hearts or minds. Racism is a principality, a demonic power over which human beings have little or no control, but which works its awful influence in their lives. Racism is a power beyond ourselves, and we need an even greater power beyond ourselves to combat it. Thankfully, we have that power in the person, the work, and the grace of Jesus Christ, who calls us through our discipleship, through our baptismal promises, and through our identity as United Methodist Christians to join him in the work of exorcising racism. The challenge for us as we stand at this critical inflection point in our history, as we come to this moment of reckoning as a nation, as a church, as individual Christians, the challenge for us is to be, move beyond being non-racist to becoming actively anti-racist, always remembering that in the words of the Apostle Paul, we aren't fighting against human enemies, but against rulers, authorities, forces of cosmic darkness and spiritual powers of evil. Therefore, pick up the full armor of God, the belt of truth around your waist, justice as your breastplate, the shield of faith, the sword of the spirit, which is God's word. Offer prayers and petitions in the spirit all the time. In the days ahead, may we heed Paul's words. May we recognize the force of cosmic darkness that is racism. May we resist that force by clothing ourselves in the full armor of God, truth, justice, faith, the word of God, and constant prayer. And may we lean on God's grace as we partner with Christ in casting out demons and transforming the world. Amen. This brings us to our time of prayer. I'm going to invite us to wherever we are, take a moment of silence to uh, lift up to God those prayers that are on our hearts, whether joys and celebrations that lift our spirits or whether um, concerns that weigh heavily on our hearts and minds. So let's offer those prayers to God now. Loving and gracious God, today we do lift up to you all of the prayers that we've whispered silently from our hearts. We also pray for those impacted by the deadly wildfires in the Western states. We pray for those who are grieving the deaths of loved ones, for the many who await word of their missing friends and relatives, for the countless number of people whose homes and belongings have been destroyed. 
We pray also for the firefighters who are battling exhaustion as well as flames and who willingly place themselves in harm's way for the sake of others. Compassionate God, as the coronavirus pandemic continues unabated, we pray for the more than six and a half million people who've contracted COVID, for the families of the more than 190,000 people who have died in, in the United States, and for the medical staff who continue to work selflessly to save lives. As the weather begins to cool and we head back indoors and flu season arrives, we pray that the infection rate won't once again rise. We especially pray for students and teachers as they return to school, keep them safe and healthy. We pray for researchers working nonstop to find a vaccine and an effective way to treat the disease. And we pray for wisdom for our governmental leaders as they make plans and make decisions on our behalf. Finally, O oh God, we pray for all those who've been hurt by racism, for people who are discriminated against, who don't have access to jobs or equal access to jobs, housing, healthcare, quality education, or the myriad of other inequities that are related to the color of their skin. Open our eyes to the ways systemic racism manifests itself. Show us that we have the power to resist powers and principalities that stand in opposition to your desire for the world. Show us how to use the abilities that we have. Enable us by the power of your grace to become anti-racist. We ask all this in the name of the one in whom there is no longer Jew or Greek, slave or free, male and female, for we are all one in him, Christ Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We're not able to, as an act of worship, make our offerings to God, but it continues to be an important part of our spiritual formation an important part of offering God our thanks and praise, an important part of um, enabling the ministry of the church to do God's work in the world. And so uh, if you would like to make an offering, uh, you can do that by going to our webpage, www.amumc.org and click on the Give tab that will bring you to a secure site where you can make an offering online, or you can certainly uh, mail your offering uh, to the church at uh, 690 Nate Whipple Highway, Cumberland, Rhode Island, 02864. Um, if you're watching and you have a home church, we ask that you would continue to be faithful to your stewardship there. But if you do choose to make uh, a gift to us, we will receive it with gratitude. And now let us um, be in a spirit of worship as we bless our offerings to God's use. Loving and gracious God, we offer our gifts as a token of our gratitude for all you are and all that you've done in our lives. We ask that you bless and use our gifts in ministries that affirm the sacred worth of all people regardless of the color of their skin, and that promote a greater understanding of the evil of racism, and that helps to shape us to become the beloved community. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. As we go into this week and we continue our reflections on racism, let us consider the ways that racism is something beyond our own personal biases or bigotries. Let's try to be aware of the ways it manifests itself in institutions, in ideologies, in um, 
all of the structures of our society in which those who are people of color um, are discriminated against. And so may God open our eyes, open our hearts, and inspire us to become anti-racist as we seek to exercise the demon of racism. We do this through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Amen.